This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to every single one of you. Mike Akins, Norm Fazekas, Chris Allen, and brand new patron, Peter. Everybody welcome in, Peter. Hello, Peter. Hey, Peter. On this episode of DTNS, Google releases Gemini to developers, Apple's new anti-theft protection for iPhones, and a hybrid computer that uses human brains. Is that what I said? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, December 13th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from studio, well, I'm here for another day or two. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Yeah, for those who uh, don't follow GDI or or Sarah's uh, other outlets, like uh, have such a good day. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, moving studios at the end of this week. I'm moving studios. I mean, you're moving boarded studios, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'm 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 moving. That's what I'm doing. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm moving zip codes, my my peeps. But uh, yeah, moving and shaking. If you have ideas for the studio, once I get up and running, it'll hopefully be a more permanent studio. So that'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, In order to form a more perfect studio is the Declaration of Independence that Sarah has signed now. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. We, we, the people of Daily Tech News Show, will now start the quick hits. Last week, it was revealed in a public letter from U.S. Senator Ron Wyden that Apple had been ordered by multiple governments to release push notification data for users. Without handing over the actual messages, this can still act as metadata to deduce things about a user. Without a formal announcement, Apple did change its terms of service to let users know that a search warrant is now necessary for it to hand over that data. Previously, Apple only required a subpoena, which is easier to obtain. On Monday, the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration issued a recall notice for Tesla models, almost all of them, after a two-year investigation into several collisions that happened while Tesla's autopilot was active. In response, Tesla is delivering a software update to more than 2 million of its cars to improved autopilot detection that monitors whether the driver is paying attention or not. Uh, the word recall is a little confusing here. It's it's kind of used for any product safety fix these days, but Tesla owners should be able to update over the air. You're not going to have to take your vehicle into a place for service. The update adds more controls and alerts to keep a driver in full control of the car, even when auto steer is engaged. And it restricts autopilot in more of the cases where conditions are considered unfavorable to autopilot. European Union lawmakers have decided on a new classification rules for the Platform Workers Directive. A list of five indicators are designed to determine if there's an employee relationship between a company and a gig worker. If any two of those five on the list are met, that means the EU is going to consider this to be employment, although a platform can push back with proper contractual evidence disputing that. There are also personal data and transparency requirements, and the text of the bill isn't public, but begins the process of parliamentary, then EU council approval. OpenAI agreed to pay publisher Axel Springer to use its content for OpenAI's language model training. Uh, Axel Springer operates a lot of publications. You probably think of them related to journals, maybe, uh, but they're also the folks who operate Politico and uh, Insider, all the insiders, Business Insider, et cetera. Among the terms of the deal, ChatGPT will now give you links to Axel Springer sources if it detects that that is where the information may have originated from. Uh, This is something Google's Bard already does. Microsoft's Bing actually does it in its implementation of ChatGPT. Also, uh, they're not the first one to sign an agreement like this with OpenAI. Associated Press, the AP, has a similar deal, although theirs is only a license to use the text in the training, not one that gives the links at the end. Mark Zuckerberg said in a Threads post today that Meta is testing a feature to show Threads posts on Mastodon and other activity pub protocol supported networks. He noted this helps interoperability, improves interaction choices, and helps content reach more people. Now, this is good news for those of you who <laughs> don't just hate Meta already and wondered if Threads would keep its commitment to the Fediverse, which it did pledge to do when the platform launched back in July. Yeah. All right, there's the quick hits. And now the big hits, the large, the f- slow hits is the opposite of quick. These are, this is the big news of the day. Uh, Google is bringing features of its Gemini models to developers. 
Maker Suite is now called AI Studio. Uh, it's still a web-based tool, but it now uses Gemini Pro to help developers with text and image prompts uh, and making chatbots that they can then integrate into their apps. When you integrate them, you use an API to call the uh, Gemini Pro model, and that API is free for up to 60 requests per second. So that's good enough to test your app for sure. It's probably good enough to have some lesser used app features or, or maybe some smaller apps, uh, but you're gonna have to pay if you have a full popular app. Google reviewers will be able to see de-identified input and output as well. So some developers may not wanna let that happen. Uh, Google said it's only doing that to improve product quality. Next year, the AI Studio tool will get access to Gemini Ultra. That's the top level of Gemini they announced, um, considered to be competitive with GPT-4. Yeah, I mean, I guess my first question would be when next year, because GPT is, uh, I'm sorry, OpenAI is working on GPT-5 or, you know, who even knows how far along they are. And I know that there's, you know, a bit of that AI, you know, race to the finish line, you know, or race to be the best. So uh, if you're a developer and these Google tools are really interesting to you already because you're, you know, in a Google developer system of some kind, um, I'd be interested to know why, because it, the market is, I don't want to say, Ooh, the market's gotten really crowded, but as a developer, you have more options than ever. So I, I, uh, I am curious to know who says, no, this is the right, this is the right one for us. Yeah. Gemini pro is pretty good. I also think it could easily be exaggerated how much farther down the road open AI is towards GPT five. Maybe I'll be surprised next year. Tune in for our predictions show to find out if, <laughs> if someone else thinks that. Uh, but, but I do, I do think that Gemini Ultra coming coming next year, you're you're not wrong. Is sort of a like, well, wait. So Gemini Pro is great, but we really would like the best you have. When do we get that? I think a lot of developers who already work in the Google verse, and there are a lot of them because of Android, uh, probably look at this as convenient. Like, oh, good, Gemini Pro will be good enough for what I want to do. I'll be able to add this kind of, uh, you know, checking or suggesting or or things like that. I'll, I'll be actually curious to see what developers make of this because of that Android pipeline, right? Whereas OpenAI is available for anybody to use. And, and granted, uh, Gemini Pro will be available for iOS developers as well. Uh, but it's it's certainly going to be appealing to people who already work with Google. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as our uh, emailer said yesterday in, in yesterday's show, you know, a lot of the stuff is going to become part of an app that you like because you like the app and yeah. you don't really care what's under the hood. The developers care what's under the hood because that's how they develop. But you don't it, or even if you can you know, point it out, it's just it's just part of an experience. It's not its fact own experience. I would love it if developers in the audience, uh, and I'm not asking you to violate your own NDAs or reveal your trade secrets, but uh, if there are good examples of what you know people are working on, yourself or others, like these are the kinds of things that I think Gemini Pro will be good for and you will see show up in apps, uh, let us know. We'd, we'd love to share that with everybody. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Google also announced a healthcare-focused model called MedLM, designed to help clinicians carry out studies and perform logistical back-office work. HCA Healthcare is one of the companies that's been testing MedLM to improve workflows on time-consuming tasks. The healthcare models are built on MedPalm2, which was trained specifically on medical data. It's available to Google Cloud customers in the U.S. with a medium and large size model available at different prices. The larger one is better at clinical studies. The medium model is trained for doctor patient summaries and other real time functions. Google says it will also offer Gemini based healthcare tools in the future. Yeah, so this one is not Gemini because this needs to be trained specifically on medical information to be particularly useful, and they already have MedPalm2. Uh, so what they're saying is we're going to adapt Gemini to be able to do what MedPalm2 does in the future, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, so it's going to get better. It was interesting to to look at this and understand some of the, uh, the details that are going on, like with HCA Healthcare. They we're giving feedback according to CNBC that the diagnostic assistance that you always hear in the headlines was not particularly what they needed. They needed doctors to get help 
with filling out forms. The, one of the examples they gave was an emergency room doctor that has to fill out a form of what was said uh, to the patient, mm -hmm. what was a summary of the responses and all of that. And uh, MedPalm2 is, was able to cut down. It was still wasn't 100% accurate, but it was able to cut down the time they took to do that. And they were saying, like, doctors spend four hours a day just doing paperwork. So if this can cut that down, it allows doctors to actually work on the things that you want doctors to do, which is helping you get healthier. Absolutely. Um, you know, with my uh, medical system, I always read all my <laughs> after after the patient was here summaries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the the, the uh, medical center that I've been to quite a bit over the last few years uh, gives me has given me plenty of uh, of good content. And, you know, and sometimes you read it and it's like, what? <laughs> this could be better. And you know, it took them a while, you know, cause they're yeah. sort of like, you know, they're, they're taking notes while you're sitting in the exam room sometimes. And sometimes, you know, it's stuff that they they've got to do afterwards or enter it into some system in a certain way. And, you know, all that must be extremely tedious when you're a busy operation who wants to see as many patients as possible. No, it's, it's interesting. We're, we're Dami and, uh, uh, um, the reverb mic uh, are both suggesting why not just hire a person to do this. Uh, first of all, that person has to be trained as well as a doctor to do it. So the doctor, you're not really getting the efficiency. This is this tool is much faster than hiring a person to do this. And that person would be trained at such a level that it'd be a waste of their time. It'd be a waste. You'd have to pay them way more than, than you would need. What this does isn't replace the doctor. It speeds up the doctor. So they're saying it's like 60% accurate. Then the doctor looks it over and corrects things and makes it accurate. It's just saving them time. It's a time saver for the doctor in a way that I don't think hiring another person to do it would be, frankly. Uh, finally, Google Cloud users who use Vertex AI can now get approval to try Imogen 2, the second version of Google's tool that creates images from a text prompt. Imogen 2 was launched at Preview at Google I.O. earlier this year. Among its new capabilities are creating text and logos, bringing it in line with Dolly 3 and Amazon's Titan image generator. And when you're the largest advertising company in the world, like Google is, that's a help. Uh, it can also render text in Chinese, English, Hindi, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, and Spanish, and it can answer questions about what's in an image now. Uh, they also added Synth ID, which is a watermark, so that you can identify anything made by uh, Imogen 2 as machine generated. Uh, and Imogen 2 users, just like Imogen 1 users, are indemnified against copyright lawsuits. Well, that's a plus, <laughs> I guess. Well, um, with all the uncertainty around, you know, what the copyright sure. law and whether you have the right to use it or not, that's a big encouragement for people to want to use these models. Yeah. That's yeah. That's what I'm saying. This is this, even though everything that we've talked about, um, of the Google announcements before are, are impressive. This is the one that I don't really have a burning need to use, uh, the latest version of this Google tool. But it's kind of the most fun to me, uh, the the idea of um, at, you know creating some sort of a prompt, whatever it is, to be able to make you know you mentioned texts and logos and just various images that isn't all you know. I think a lot of people go like, oh yeah, the AI images, you know, it's like lots of you know fantasy stuff and uh -huh. um, you know being able to create you know Sarah's sitting on a spaceship, you know that sitting on an apple that's you know, in a vortex, <laughs> it's like, okay, Aliens well, that can be creative. into a Chili's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that, that's all, that's, that's just fun. And I mean, in many cases, that's actual work for folks. Um, but to, to do a little bit more, I guess, pedestrian stuff that again would be time consuming. Maybe you're creating some sort of a, you know, a, um, a slideshow that you're going to pitch to, a potential client, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this is, it sounds more like that would be where a lot of Google Cloud users would would find this. Less of like a, oh, just say we did it. And more of a, oh, this, this actually was a really great artistic use of my time. Yeah, and if you've used these image generators, you know they're, they've been horrible at text. You can't do it. Uh, so the fact that these models are now starting to get text uh, is a big uh, advantage. And like I said, for advertisers, that's going to be great. Like I want to, I want to create my logo with certain messaging, and you can do it fast. Uh, Google's going to build mm -hmm. that into things like AdSense, you know, with with Imogen eventually. So yeah, uh, and that's that's what Amazon's doing with it. I, I can't imagine Google wouldn't. 
Uh, Google released a video last week, got a lot of attention. It had been edited to look like Gemini was responding to queries in real time. A Google blog made it clear what was actually going on, so they weren't like trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. But a lot of people noticed the discrepancy, and some even said it's kind of a faked demo. So Google, t- uh, so Google YouTube channel uh, Greg Technology decided to replicate the Gemini video. He does a lot of uh, just kind of walkthroughs in real time using OpenAI's GPT-4 vision. It's not as polished or as quick as Google's version, but it is in real time, and we'll have that link in our show notes. Uh, meanwhile, during our live stream, we got a super chat. We never get super chats, so thank you, Tony, for that. Apple is testing an update called Stolen Device Protection for a future version of iOS, probably in the 17 uh, uh, area, 17 dot something. It can delay the ability to alter critical information on your phone. That delay will last an hour and will also require biometric authentication, either your fingerprint or face ID, at both the start and end of that hour. It will go into effect for things like changing your Apple ID password, removing face or touch ID from the phone, changing a phone's passcode, turning off Find My, uh, updating various account security settings, etc. The phone will not introduce the delay if you're in a recognized location, like your home or work location that you're normally in. Uh, It's meant to deter a thief who not only gets your phone, but also has somehow been able to see over your shoulder or something and get your passcode. So, yeah. So the, um, the, it, it sounds like what, and, and Joanna Stern over at the wall street journal did a great video recently about, uh, the rise in iPhone specific theft and kind of, you know, theft rings and, and how a lot of this stuff does happen. And partly because yeah, Let's say you're at a bar and, you know, maybe you're even chatting up the person next to you. You're being friendly, you know, and they've got their phone and maybe they've unlocked it a couple of times. So you've got the passcode, you know, then things can get a little bit strange. Uh, I love the idea of, okay, let's say someone goes, all right, well, I know what Sarah's passcode is. And now I'm going to, you know, take the phone, quickly open the phone, quickly add um, a... um, what do they call it? You can uh, like it's like a, a a separate verification code that can override things like your Apple ID uh, password, and then that way, even if I go, oh no, they stole my phone. Okay, let me get to the uh, quickest computer and you know go into Find My on iCloud. Then I'm locked out. That is a scenario that's thankfully never happened to me. Uh, it's probably happened to at least somebody you know because it does happen fairly often, and it sounds like it's on the rise. This is a great idea. It's a great idea because if someone has my passcode, they take my phone, they go like, eh, crap, all right, well, you know, it's not it's not her face, um, but uh, they have to wait another hour and then try my face again. I mean, this becomes like exponentially harder for someone to get into my phone to steal various things like not only passwords, but I don't know, be able to go into my Venmo. There's no money in there. But if there were, you know, that sort of thing is how uh, people have gotten a lot of money stolen from them as well. Yeah, I've been watching uh, another YouTuber uh, called Anna Lee, and she was in London uh, and talking about in the past how her phone had been stolen multiple times. And, and it's that exact kind of scenario you're talking about, right? Where someone kind of observes you until they can figure out your passcode, then just secret, you know, sneakily grabs the phone or, or, or does some kind of social engineering where they like, you know, put a magazine on your table and pretend to sell you a magazine and then steal your phone from underneath the magazine, which is one way. Yeah. She or they, or they, they just it. straight up take yeah. it from you. Yeah. You know? like, yeah. What, like however they get it theft. from you, they, they get yeah. it and quickly, uh, unlock it and change all the settings. Uh, and, and so this is meant to stop them from being able to do that. Uh, I, I know the reverb mic said, great, it makes it harder to get into my phone. No, it doesn't make it harder to get into your phone because it requires biometrics uh, to, to, to activate. And if you're at home or you're at work, uh, and I don't know how it's going to work. If you can set other places for it, it won't activate. You'll, when you're at home, you'll never see it. When you're at work, you shouldn't see it. Now, maybe you want it to work. Maybe you work, work at a place where you're at risk of phone theft. Uh, but it's only going to happen on changes. It's not going to be happen on getting into the phone. It's going to happen on things that would stop you from being able to find the phone if it was taken. How often do you need to change your passcode uh, or change your Apple ID or or remove fingerprint or face ID 
and you're not at home and you can't wait an hour. Uh, I, I think this is pretty a reasonable yeah, a way, way to protect to you. It. Yeah. Cause it, it's yeah, just not going to come indeed. up much. It, it's, it's, it's an inconvenience uh, for, I mean, I'm sure anybody out there can go, okay, well, here's a scenario where I would need all of these things. And so this is, this makes my life less convenient. It is going to be an opt-in option. You don't have to do it. Yeah. You don't have to use it, but that's right. But the, but the, you know, <laughs> the other side of the coin, uh, the, you know, the, the worst case scenario was pretty bad. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, whether, whether all you want to do is just wipe that data, you know, wipe the phone, you know, there's stuff on there that m might be in iCloud, you can get it back. It's not the end of the world. I mean, there's so many scenarios where theft is going to happen. I mean, if someone wants to physically take your phone, you know, if someone comes up to me with a gun and says, give me your phone, they're getting it. But, uh, but to have control over how that phone could then really very unlikely it could be used to get into anything that, you know, is, is extremely sensitive information makes a lot of sense to me. And also just kind of going through all of the features of stolen device protection, um, and what it will offer and how exactly it will work was a really just, it was a helpful reminder to go into my settings and look at some stuff that, I mean, I've set mm -hmm. everything up the way that I want it to, but I haven't, there's certain settings I haven't played around with in quite a while, like an alphanumeric uh, passcode, you know, the passcode itself. I, I know that, that that's an option. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's been, you know, I, I've got a, it used to be, remember it was one, two, it, well, it wasn't, my password was it not used to be only four, numbers. but it, yeah. it was four numbers and then they made it six and then they made it custom and then they made custom alphanumeric. And I remember going, eh, that sounds kind of annoying. Well, Today, I changed my tune. Uh, there are lots of little things that are designed to keep us more secure. And so, you know, it's, it's a good, it's a, tis the season, everyone. Be more secure. Yeah. Uh, and to Weird Ami, who's like, is there any option other than biometrics? Uh, not a secure one. Like this, this is the thing, right? Like if you want it to be secure, then you have to make sure that people can't get into it. So if you don't want to use biometrics, which by the way, are very well audited on device and very secure, but if for whatever reason you don't want to use it, then your next best option would be to use an extremely long passcode. Uh, something that would be very hard for someone to observe and repeat. Uh, and then make sure that you hide it when you use that passcode. You, you, your, own, your other option is to DIY it, to make passcodes more secure. Most people aren't going to do that. Biometrics are extremely reliable and extremely secure and extremely well audited. So for most people, I think that's probably going to be a good option. So I'm, I'm glad Apple, Apple did this. And I'm glad they made it opt in so that you don't have to do it if you don't want to, like Weird Ami. Uh, you can discuss these kinds of options with other folks in our Discord. The way to get into the Daily Tech News Show Discord is by becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com slash DTNS. A study published in Nature Electronics describes a hybrid biocomputer system called BrainOware that can identify voices with 78% accuracy using human neurons. Yep, you heard it here. The scientists combined clusters of human neurons derived from stem cells into brain organoids. Then an organoid was connected to thousands of electrodes. A machine learning algorithm learned to interpret the signals from the organoid and then combine that processing power with more traditional silicon. The combined system was trained on 240 recordings of eight different people and then tested with new statements from those people. So as if to say, all right, hybrid biocomputer, is that Sarah or is that Tom? 78% accuracy is pretty high. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> I, I could already hear and see the jokes about, uh, using a brain, uh, to be a computer. The perspective of the scientists making this was to learn how brains work, uh, not to make a brain computer hybrid as a practical device. This is apparently really hard to make. It's hard to keep the cells alive. Uh, especially if you want to use it in different situations. Uh, but they think it's worth it because it could have implications for treating neural diseases like Alzheimer's, et cetera. Um, and, and so that's why they want to do it. That's not to say somebody couldn't take their research and try to figure out 
you know, how to take advantage of the processing power of human brain cells. Cause you know, these scientists have said we would like to make it easier to grow these organoids, et cetera. Is that what they called them? Uh, so who knows, uh, maybe, yes. maybe down the road, we will lead to uh, little, little Petri dish brains in the middle of our computers. Well, and one of the scientists um, that was quoted in the study also mentioned this could supplement and even replace, at least in mm -hmm. certain circumstances, animal models of brains. You know, animal testing is a part of science. And if something like this uh, can can be as effective, then that that's that's a that's a that's a plus for me. Yeah, because you're just growing the stem cells. You 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 barely can. I mean, some people don't want you to even harvest a stem cell, but harvesting a stem cell is pretty non-invasive uh, as things go and pretty harmless. And then you take the stem cells and you just grow other cells. Uh, I think this kind of situation is also very far from the other objection I could imagine, Sarah, which would be someone going, what if the organoid becomes self-aware and it can feel? like is the, and, and yes, I would be uncomfortable with that. These things aren't that complex mm. yet. Yet. Right. But, you know, something down the line, I guess, if they got more complex that you'd want to be worried about. I mean, if they can recognize your voice, they know who did this to them. Right? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, th this actually, this does not give me the willies at all. I think this is, you know, obviously scientists say this is hard to do. Early days, promising stuff. We're going to continue to research. Wouldn't it be great if we understand things that are have been historically extremely hard to understand, like, you know, types of dementia? That's, that's, uh, I, I, I can't argue with that. Yeah. No, as uh, someone who's got Alzheimer's in, in my family, uh, I would like lots of advances to be made on that uh, before I ever have to to worry about it. And that day is getting closer and closer. So, yeah, this is this is interesting stuff. It's it's headline grabbing stuff because brains. Uh, but but it's also it's also good for medicine. Um, and there I'm not going to rule out that there might be some interesting computer related uh, discoveries out of this sort of thing. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Norm wrote in, hi, Norm, and said, I love the discussion of chicken crisper gene editing and the follow-on with GMOs. I appreciate how Dr. Nikki brought up how GMO has technically been around as long as we've been breeding plants, and it isn't the boogeyman that people try to make it out to be. Norm says, that last part is my humble opinion. My wife's background is in plant physiology, and she gets these types of questions all the time. And it was really refreshing to hear Dr. Nikki so succinctly explain them. At least it's refreshing since she's agreeing to my thoughts on the subject <laughs> exactly. Hope you didn't get too many disparaging responses. And actually, Norm, we didn't. Uh, maybe somebody just didn't feel like writing in, or maybe they haven't heard the show yet. Or maybe Dr. Nikki just explained things so well that, uh, you know, we <laughs> nobody got mad at the GMO conversation. But I agree. I, I, I learned a lot yesterday. And um, it's always nice to have somebody who can 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 sort of lay this out in terms that make a lot of sense to people when those terms can sometimes be fear mongering on their own. Yeah, I, I, I love in Norm's email. The thing I love the most about it uh, is that he acknowledges that it's refreshing because she agrees with him. Uh, that That's good self-awareness for us all. That's a good reminder that like, oh, well, of course, we always like it when when somebody is saying something that we already agree with. Uh, the test is when Dr. Nikki or anybody else uh, says something that you don't agree with, and then you think about it and maybe alter your opinion, maybe not even fully agreeing with them, but uh, that's how we all learn. So I, I, I like to highlight that part of that. Uh, that's We need more of that, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk more about the end of E3. You may have noticed we thought Scott Johnson was going to be on the show today talking about this, but uh, Scott is sick. Um, he, he's okay, but, you know, he's not feeling up to stuff. So he he had to cancel the morning stream, and he also wasn't able to be on Daily Tech News Show today. Uh, so we are going to talk about it without him in Good Day Internet. So become a patron and find out what we think at our wake for E3. We're all going to share our memories and drink, uh, uh, I don't know, 
jolt. Uh, <laughs> what, what do you drink in memory of E3, Sarah? I don't know. Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew. Uh, so yeah, stick I around don't... for that next. <laughs> I don't have any Mountain Dew, but it'll I'll have some in spirit. Reminder, our show is live Monday through Friday, and you can catch it live at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Don't miss it. Talk to you soon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>